Hey, can I ask you some really simple yes or no questions? Is Donald Trump a fascist? What about Jair Bolsonaro in Brazil, or Marine Le Pen and her national rally party in France? The Ku Klux Klan? The Proud Boys? In reality, this line of thinking isn't as simple as we'd probably like it to be. Sure, there are a handful of people who will haphazardly apply the term fascist to any remotely racist or reactionary person or group. But on the other hand, there are also those lovely people who will just refuse to accept that anyone or anything could possibly be fascist in the year of our Lord 2019. Ah yes, how convenient. Pretend there are still Nazis running around in 2019, so you can go around accusing everyone you disagree with of being one. Don't you know the actual fascists haven't existed since the 1940s? Why don't you stop smearing honest conservatives with these false and completely unfounded accusations? Actually, I don't call everyone I disagree with a fascist. Just the people who act like fucking fascists. Now get the fuck out of my house. So, Trump, Proud Boys, whoever, are they fucking fascists? Actually, these are difficult, complicated questions to answer, and for each of them you'll probably get a different answer depending on who you ask. The confusion and controversy around these questions isn't helped by the fact that we can't even seem to agree on what the fuck this fascism thing really is. And again, this is another one of those things where you'll get a whole bunch of contradicting answers from different people. Some people like to smear anti-fascists as the real fascists because of the occasional incidents of violence at anti-fascist protests. If you ask these people what their definition of fascism is, they'll probably tell you something like using violence to suppress opposition or pushing your political viewpoint through violence, you know, something along those lines. That definition of fascism can be dismissed pretty much out of hand. Unless, of course, you want to go ahead and label every government, army, police force, militia, and revolutionary movement in history as fascist. It doesn't take much more than a cursory glance at the world around you to understand that political violence is everywhere, all the time. So no, anti-fascists are not the real fascists because Richard Spencer got punched in the face or because Tommy Robinson got a milkshake dumped on his head. But that's one of the more ridiculous examples of a wrong definition of fascism. Some of the other definitions that get thrown around can seem more reasonable. For instance, there are some who would define fascism as any sufficiently authoritarian state. One that criminalizes dissent, cracks down on free speech, and so on. But when we look at countries around the world, we see a broad, multifaceted spectrum of authoritarianism. There are countless states, both historical and present, that restrict the rights of women, oppress indigenous populations, block access to the internet, ban trade unions, and so on. Yet places like China or Saudi Arabia are barely ever characterized as fascist regimes. So, to cut through the mystery and the delusion and to work out a real, functional definition of fascism, a good a place to start as any as the regimes that we can all agree were definitely fascist. Mussolini's Italy and Hitler's Germany. These days, fascism is a dirty word. No optics-minded fascist will publicly refer to themselves as such, with most modern fascists preferring the significantly less scary word nationalist. But, of course, this wasn't always the case. Benito Mussolini founded the world's first self-proclaimed fascist movement, the Fasci of Combat, in 1919. The formation and growth of Mussolini's fascist movement took place in a period of serious political tension in Italy. Along with the end of the First World War came an economic crisis. Unemployment was high, and you could say that shit got pretty intense. Mass strikes were breaking out across the country. Inspired by the workers' revolution in Russia only a few years earlier, workers were taking over their factories and establishing workers' councils. Now, there's a good chance you've seen pundits and propagandists on the right pushing the idea that fascism is a socialist movement. These dipshits only get away with that because they're taking advantage of people's lack of education on the actual character and history of the fascist movement. The fascists in Italy made it their business to crush the power of organized workers by any means necessary. Mussolini's black shirts regularly carried out violent attacks on striking workers and on socialist meetings. The first major fascist attack on the left was an assault on the Milan office of Avanti, 
the Italian Socialist Party's daily paper in April of 1919. Around 300 fascists attacked the officers armed with pistols, grenades and other weapons. The premises were destroyed and three socialists were killed. In November 1920, the fascists attacked a newly elected socialist council in Bologna. Ten were murdered and a further 60 were wounded. In the first half of 1921, hundreds of places of workers' organisation were attacked, including branches of the communist and socialist parties and trade unions and worker co-ops. And all this is just in the genesis years of the fascist movement. I could go on, but I think I've hopefully made my point already. History shows without a shadow of a doubt that the fascists fought the real socialist movement tooth and nail and went to any lengths they could to prevent workers from taking power. It's also worth pointing out that fascism was backed and financed by wealthy landowners and industrialists, who saw the fascists as an effective counter to the socialists and trade unionists who threatened their fortunes. But more on that later. One of the most renowned texts in the struggle to understand fascism is Italian philosopher Umberto Eco's essay Ur Fascism, or Eternal Fascism. Eco, who grew up in fascist Italy, wrote his Ur Fascism as an attempt to identify the characteristics of fascism to aid in identifying present and future fascist movements. His assessment acknowledged that fascism was unlikely to return in the exact same form in different historic circumstances, and that a political movement or current doesn't have to label itself fascist to be essentially fascist in character. As he put it, even though political regimes can be overturned and ideologies criticised and delegitimized, behind a regime and its ideology there is always a way of thinking and feeling, a series of cultural habits, a nebula of obscure instincts and unfathomable drives. Eco identifies 14 characteristics of Ur fascism in his essay. It's a bit tricky to try and put together short summaries for each of the 14 characteristics as Eco takes a few paragraphs to flesh each one out in detail but I feel like it's important to go through them because doing so makes starkly obvious the parallels between the fascist movements of the past and the ones of today. The first is the cult of tradition. The notion that an imagined glorious past is superior to the present and should therefore be returned to. This also implies a rejection of the modern. A sentiment that things that are new and unexpected and challenge old ways of thinking are not to be trusted. This ties in with a profound distrust of intellectuals and critical thinkers, people who try to come up with coherent understandings of the world we live in. Particularly understandings that contradict the fascist worldview. Dissent is tantamount to treason. Diversity is also treated with scorn, while conformity and homogeneity are romanticised. This tends to take the form of vicious racism, homophobia and transphobia, as well as contempt for the disabled. Fascism seeks to appeal to social frustration, particularly the frustration of the middle classes. Why the middle classes in particular? We'll get to that in a bit. Fascism also seeks to unify its following by encouraging people to identify with the nation, particularly against a common enemy. There's an obsession with conspiracy theories about hostile forces from both without and within scheming to destroy the nation. The followers of fascism are also encouraged to feel humiliated by the perceived power and affluence of the enemy. The Nazis' anti-Semitic caricatures of greedy Jewish people are a perfect example of this. War, struggle and violence are glorified, and pacifist sentiment is shunned. Life must be considered an eternal struggle against the enemy, and pacifism is the same as taking their side. Fascism employs a kind of popular elitism, the idea that our people are the best and outsiders are simply inferior. Strong hierarchy is treated as natural and desirable, and those at the top are encouraged to view those beneath them as their inferiors. There's also the fetishization of heroism, the idea of becoming a martyr for your nation and your people. Machismo is also dominant in the fascist psyche. In men, dominance over others is extremely desirable, while passivity and traits considered feminine are ridiculed. This usually extends to hatred of LGBTI people who are considered deviant. Fascism utilises something Eco calls qualitative populism to create an illusion of popular control of society. Individual citizens are not asked to speak for themselves, instead the leaders of fascism speak for them, claiming to embody the will of the people. Newspeak, a term borrowed from Orwell, is essentially the distortion of language by removing words and vocabulary that aids in the expression of ideas that are problematic to fascist ideology. Eco critiques the idea that the best way to understand fascism is to read the political writings of the propagandists of the fascist movement, such as Gentile's Doctrine of Fascism or Hitler's Mein Kampf. 
he points out that fascism completely lacks its own philosophy or principles and that fascist movements will change their political focuses, their apparent principles, and even their symbols to take advantage of popular sentiment. One of the examples of this that he cites is Mussolini's apparent change in religious conviction over the course of his political career. Earlier in his career, he fashioned himself a militant atheist. He regularly mocked and derided religion in his writings and speeches. But the massive influence of the Catholic Church in Italy drove Mussolini to try and gain their favour. In his 1928 autobiography, Mussolini wrote, I have seen the religious spirit bloom again. Churches once more are crowded. The ministers of God are themselves invested with new respect. Fascism has done and is doing its duty. In 1929, he signed a concordat with the Catholic Church, which declared Catholicism the official state religion, as well as putting Catholicism in all secondary schools and banning birth control. It's not hard to think of examples where modern fascists and their allies have bended and twisted their publicly professed principles to match popular sentiment and gain support. They'll say that political violence is unacceptable when a fascist gets slammed with a milkshake and then cheer on violent white supremacists terrorist attacks in their own private spaces. They may call for the oppression of LGBTI people, but when a gay nightclub is attacked by a Muslim terrorist, they're more than happy to take the opportunity to bleat about how Islam is incompatible with our progressive values. And their hatred of Jewish people won't stop them from supporting the Israeli government to appeal to a broader right-wing base. In an attempt to aesthetically connect themselves to the working class, fascists are also fond of co-opting the symbols of popular movements. The Nazis adopted the name National Socialists because, in Germany at the time, Socialist was how any party that professed to represent the working class identified. Here in Australia, fascists have taken to adorning their political parties and their bodies with the Eureka flag, which has traditionally been a symbol of the Australian trade union movement. And recently, the fascist Australian Liberty Alliance had its name officially changed to Yellow Vests Australia in an attempt to mimic the decidedly more egalitarian Yellow Vest movement in France. So, if shock horror fascists are actually lying scumbags and shock horror we can't just take them at their word, then how do we go about getting to the core of what fascism actually is? In my opinion, you have to take a look at the historical conditions that brought about the rise of fascism in Italy and Germany in the 1920s. Which brings us to our second expert on fascism, Jewish-Russian revolutionary Leon Trotsky. While Eco's analysis of fascism focuses more on the ideology and psychology behind fascism, Trotsky's looks more at the economic and historical background that allowed it to come to power. While the two look at fascism from different angles, their assessments aren't contradictory. In fact, there are common threads that run through both. The sixth characteristic of Ur fascism that came up earlier is fascism's appeal to the frustrated middle classes. The small business people who face pressure from the organised working class below and suppression from the capitalist class above. Their lack of connection to the socialist and trade union movements, as well as their economic frustration in a time of crisis, made the middle classes the perfect vessel to move fascism forward. One tool in the fascist arsenal is the redirection of middle class anger toward working class people. People in the middle class have a lot to be frustrated about, especially so in times of economic crisis. In these times, middle class people might be inclined to turn their anger toward the ruling class of society, the rich and the powerful few who control the world's monopolies and are actually responsible for their problems. Fascism tells the middle classes that their true enemy is the organised working class, the trade unions and left-wing parties who present a threat to the ruling class. These entitled ruffians are a threat to your way of life, the fascists say. Vote for us and we'll put a stop to them and secure our nation's future. It's worth noting that while the middle class tends to make up the basis of the fascist movement, working class people aren't immune to being dragged into the fascist ranks, particularly in times and places where workers are less organised. Racial scapegoating is another fundamental part of how fascists grow their base of support. Umberto Eco's seventh characteristic of Ur fascism discusses how fascists form conspiracies of enemies from both without and within. More often than not, these enemies are racial ones. For fascists today, the enemies coming from without are Muslims and Arab and African migrants. The enemies within, for both modern fascists and their predecessors, are communists and Jews, or globalists if you like your anti-Semitism a little watered down. Anti-Semitism has been a favourite flavour of racism for fascists throughout history, 
and for reasons that go beyond its prevalence in Europe in the early 20th century. Anti-Semitism lets fascists convince you that the seemingly opposite forces of the organized working class and the affluent ruling class are actually the same enemy. Both classical and modern fascist propaganda paint wealthy capitalist bankers and organized communists as co-conspirators in a Jewish plot to destroy the white race. Or a globalist or cultural Marxist plot to destroy Western civilization if you prefer a more alt-light take on things. None of this is to say that fascism cannot be fascism without anti-Semitism, but its unique utility as a way of erasing discussion of class and replacing it with racism makes it a recurring element. Trotsky compares the role of the middle classes in the rise of fascism to a battering ram, used to destroy the political power and independence of working people, as well as the more democratic aspects of capitalist society that allowed them to get that power and independence in the first place. But when fascism finally took state power, the newly established fascist states didn't do much to advance the interests of the middle classes at all. So if the middle classes are the battering ram of fascism, then who exactly is it standing behind this ram? Who benefits from all this? Well, to answer that question, I think we need to take a look back at the history again. In both Italy and Germany, fascism came to power in very similar historical circumstances. The waves of strikes and workers' self-management in Italy between 1919 and 1920 that I touched on earlier became known as the Bienio Rosso, or Red Years. For the ruling class of Italy, this was a time of uncertainty and chaos. It was only years earlier in 1917 that the workers and peasants of Russia had overthrown their rulers. Who was to say that Italy wouldn't be the next to go red? Mussolini's fascist movement was a gift to the Italian elite. It was a strong, well-organized movement with the express goal of crushing the workers' activity that the capitalists were so shit scared of. With Mussolini's march on Rome in October of 1922, it became clearer than ever to the ruling class that keeping up business as usual in Italy wouldn't be possible anymore. The fascists did not need to fight against the existing Italian state to take power. Italy's king, Victor Emmanuel III, appointed Mussolini prime minister on the second day of the demonstration. King Victor described Mussolini as a strong man who imposed order on Italy. In other words, he was someone who was willing to implement the authoritarian and anti-democratic measures needed to crush the workers' movement and ensure that the threat of a socialist society being formed was neutralized. And the new fascist government played its part well. Under fascist rule, trade unions were oppressed and eventually closed down entirely. Workers lost all right of representation and strikers were imprisoned. All rival political parties and their publications were banned. The story in Germany was extremely similar. 1918 brought revolution to Germany. The country was in bad shape after the First World War and the Russian Revolution inspired the working people of Germany to fight for something better. Unfortunately, the leading party of the German left, the Social Democratic Party, were not keen on a socialist society being formed in Germany as a result of this revolution. The Social Democrats enlisted right-wing paramilitary groups to crush the revolutionary socialists attempt at an uprising. They then had the leaders of the revolutionary socialists, Rosa Luxemburg and Karl Liebknecht, assassinated. Instead of a socialist society being established, the existing German Empire was replaced with a more democratic, capitalist German Republic. Some semblance of order was restored in Germany, but the underlying political tensions didn't go away. Not even a year after the new government was established, an attempted coup known as the Kapp Putsch was staged in an attempt to restore the old German Empire. In response, millions of workers participated in a massive general strike, or a strike across all industries, shutting down the economy and leading to the collapse of the coup within four days. Many of the participants in the 1920 Kapp Putsch went on to become some of the first members of Hitler's Nazi Party, which staged its own attempt at a coup in November 1923, following a wave of further radical working class activity over the course of the year. The Beer Hall Putsch was Hitler's attempt to seize control of the German state by force. Like the Kapp Putsch three years earlier, the Beer Hall Putsch didn't work out. Hitler was charged with high treason and sentenced to five years imprisonment. Hitler's time in prison was short-lived though. After just nine months behind bars, he was pardoned by the Supreme Court of Bavaria and allowed to walk free. Hitler ran for president and lost in the 1932 election against the then-current president Paul Ludwig Hans Anton von Beneckendorf und von Hindenburg. 
Oh, yikes, that's a bit of a mouthful. Uh, let's just go with von Hindenburg. The Social Democratic Party were not in favour of a revolutionary approach to anti-fascism. They put their faith in the existing German state and held the line that von Hindenburg could be trusted to uphold the status quo and keep Hitler out of power. They were wrong. Possibly more wrong than anybody has ever been about anything ever. A letter signed by prominent politicians, industrialists and businessmen was addressed to von Hindenburg urging him to appoint Hitler the role of Chancellor of Germany. After a series of meetings with the president, as well as leading generals and businessmen, Hitler was given the role of chancellor in January of 1933. Hitler was exactly the man the German ruling class needed at this point in history. The German Revolution of 1918 had left the balance of power between the ruling class and the working masses skewed. The Social Democratic Party was the most powerful in the country, and the Communist Party was also extremely popular. In 1929 came a devastating stock market crash, which didn't do wonders for the political stability of the country. As in Italy, large sections of Germany's ruling class came to realise that business as usual was no longer a feasible strategy for keeping their power intact. And as in Italy, this led to the eventual embrace of fascism by the establishment. Four weeks after Hitler's ascendance to power, the Reichstag, the German parliament building, was set ablaze. The fire was blamed on communists by Hitler's government, but there are historians who reckon the whole thing may have been a false flag. In any case, the fire was used as the pretense to pass an emergency decree to suspend civil liberties, including freedom of expression, assembly and the press, and begin a ruthless crackdown on their political enemies. First, they came for the communists. Thousands of members of the Communist Party were arrested, including every communist delegate in the German parliament. The Communist Party was not formally banned at this point, but in most cases being a member of the party was considered the equivalent of treason, and so the members were dealt with accordingly. Not a month later, President von Hindenburg signed an amendment known as the Enabling Act granting Hitler ultimate power and completing the transformation of Germany's government into a fascist dictatorship. The German capitalist class played a key role in this process. In order to make sure they would be able to pass the act, the Nazis needed a favourable result in the 1933 election. To this end, Hitler held a secret meeting with at least 20 of Germany's top capitalists, where over 2 million Reichsmarks were raised to fund the Nazis' campaign. Some of the companies that funded Hitler's ascension to dictatorship that might sound more familiar are Siemens and Allianz, both of which recently celebrated LGBT Pride Month. How progressive of them. Now, the point I'm trying to make here isn't that Siemens or Allianz today are uniquely bad or that you should boycott them or something. What I want to get across is that corporations will almost always do whatever they think will boost their profit margins. Whether that's joining in on a pride parade or helping a genocidal dictator commit mass murder. It's all the same to them. The only party to oppose the Enabling Act was the Social Democratic Party. The party that had only a few years earlier placed its faith in von Hindenburg and the German establishment to halt Hitler's rise to power. They were banned, along with every other remaining political party aside from the Nazis, within three months. Trade unions were also banned, and going on strike was made illegal. In the revolution of 1918, the working class had the chance to take power into their own hands, and failed. The goal of the Nazis was to make sure they never had that chance again. The same basic sequence of events played out in both Italy and Germany. A potentially revolutionary situation, followed by workers failing to take power, followed by fascism being gifted power by the existing state and establishment. The way fascism's rise played out in both cases vindicates Trotsky's analysis of fascism. That is, as a mass movement based in the middle class, utilised by the ruling class as a last ditch attempt to destroy the power of the working class by doing away with the democratic freedoms that allowed them to get that power in the first place. It's important to note that acknowledging fascism's role as a mass movement for the destruction of working class power doesn't make the fascist movements and individuals today that exist outside of that context any less fascist. While fascism as a mass movement tends to arise in specific historical circumstances and take a specific form, Smaller fascist organisations are able to crop up anywhere in the world at any time. The examples are all around us. From Golden Dawn in Greece, to the BNP and the EDL in the UK, to the alt-right movement in the United States and around the world, fascism hasn't gone away. And this isn't just a matter of people having the wrong ideas or the wrong opinions. 
These groups are actively rallying, organizing, and recruiting because they want to see civil rights destroyed and anyone they think is the wrong race or sexuality purged from society. And their ringleaders know their history and they know exactly how to get there. A lot of the individuals and groups that push these ideas and agendas will insist till the cows come home that they're not actually fascists at all. The cleverer ones will even denounce fascism completely and insist that they're for something completely different. But let me ask you this, if I told you that I thought working people and their bosses' interests were intrinsically counterposed, that capitalism was an inherently unstable and inhumane system hurtling us towards catastrophe, and that the only solution was for working people to rise up and take control of their workplaces and society, and then told you I'm not a socialist, would you believe me? The thing is, the fascists know fascism has a bad rep. They might draw one or two distinctions between themselves and the historical Nazis to try and absolve themselves of the comparison. But trying to come up with a punchy, catch-all definition of fascism that'll let you easily sort everyone on earth into fascists and not fascists isn't really possible. It's a bit like trying to define a sandwich. What is a sandwich? Well, the Oxford Dictionary defines a sandwich as an item of food consisting of two pieces of bread with a filling between them. Great, so that makes a burger a sandwich. But some people might argue that you need sliced bread to make a sandwich a sandwich, and that using a burger bun instead turns it into a burger, not a sandwich. But some might argue that it's the patty that makes a burger a burger and not a sandwich. But if that's the case, then what do you call a patty between sliced bread? If I get a sub from Subway, that definitely looks like a sandwich to me, but the two pieces of bread are connected. They're not separate. So how can that meet the Oxford definition? Ultimately, it's up to your own judgment what you consider to qualify for the honor of being a sandwich. But if enough of the basic elements are there, if all the core characteristics that make a sandwich a sandwich are present, then generally speaking, no one will call foul if you call it one. The same doesn't seem to go for fascism, because as we've established, most people don't have a very good grip on what the fuck it is. And not to mention, there are also some bad faith actors in play in these debates as well. If you started watching this video because you wanted to be handed some kind of fashometer that could tell you who's a fascist and who isn't, then I'm sorry to let you down, I guess. What I do hope I've done with this video is brought you closer to an understanding of what fascism is and what it's all about. It's easy to get a sense that there's something very wrong with the world we live in. It's clear on some level to most people that the forces that pull the strings in our society don't care about any of us ordinary folk, only about serving their own interests. But it's important to not let anyone fool you as to who your oppressors are. To make you think the Muslim or the Jew sitting by you on the train or bagging your groceries at the supermarket is your real enemy. Fascists put despair, hatred and contempt for the truth at the heart of their worldview. We need to put hope, compassion, and ruthless pursuit of the truth at the heart of ours. Admittedly, this video has been more focused on the what it is part of fascism rather than the how to fight it part, uh, but that might be a good premise for another video someday. But for now, I will just say this. Get involved with your local anti-fascists, especially if you're near a major city where fascists regularly rally, and seek out the organizations, campaign groups, and activist networks that are dedicated to mobilizing against them. The more people who show up to counter rallies against the fascists, the less confident they become and the harder it is for them to organize and to recruit. Hitler himself recognized in one of his speeches that if the fascist movement in Germany had been crushed when it was small and in its infancy, then it never would have had the chance to grow into the mass movement that was able to capture the power of the German state. So don't wait around. Get on the streets and get active.